gentlemen. Um, like I announced before, we're still waiting for our uh, fourth speaker of the first uh, session of this panel. However, as he's traveling from Macedonia, uh, we ask you to please be considerate of his uh, late coming. Uh, so, welcome to this conference on social identities among youth in Kosovo. Uh, interplay between ethnic, religious and national belonging. Um, this is a portion of a research project that myself and Katrina Kermendi, who's joining me today, my colleague from University of Pristina, have been engaged for the past two years. It's a regional project uh, that looks at the combination of identities in terms of how people identify with their nationality, ethnicity and religion, not just in Kosovo, but also including three other countries in Western Balkans, Serbia, Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the reason why uh, these countries were chosen and what the focus of this project actually is, is that we were really interested to look at how and why we focus actually on youth, is that we wanted to, to see um, how these identities are shaped among youth, among a, a, a portion of the population uh, within these countries that has been uh, grown and has been socialized pretty much after the conflicts have occurred between the groups and after uh, the uh, dissolvement of Yugoslavia. So in a way um, these hold the potential or hold the key uh, to not just understanding where this phenomena is at the current point in time but they also hold the key to potential um, intervention programs and, and policy implications that actually might lead to solutions and improve the hardships in intergroup relations. And this is the focus of the entire uh, research per se. Um, it has been generously funded by a regional platform called Regional Research Promotion Program, uh, for which our speaker here today, Nita Bilibashi, is going to talk a bit more. So she's going to tell you a bit more details about what the focus of this, uh, this uh, network is and how researchers, interested researchers and groups of researchers can actually apply for funds. Um, I'm also joined here today by Mr. Adrian Zeciri, who comes from the European Centre for Minority Issues in Kosovo, a centre that is very active in terms of not just um, policy analysis and legal framework, but also practical issues at hand, uh, uh, especially focusing on community rights or minority rights in Kosovo. Uh, we're soon going to be joined by a third speaker, um, Ali Bayaziti, who comes from Southeast European University in Macedonia. He's actually our colleague from the team from Macedonia, and he's going to present the same results, but from this country. Um, in the second panel, um, I will we'll be joined by uh, Ms. Venera Ciocai, uh, who is a, um, one of the activists and comes from a very active youth organization called Youth Initiative for Human Rights in Kosovo. It's a, a portion of a regional platform, again, of youth organizations that engage in a lot of activities that focus on reconciliation between uh, conflicting uh, groups. Uh, and she's going to present uh, also um, a portion of their work and one of their latest uh, research studies as well. And then lastly, uh, but not the least, we're going to be joined by um, Eraldin Pazliu, who comes from um, um, a renowned media outlet, Kosovo 2.0. And he's going to be talking a bit more about how media helps or hinders intergroup relations in terms of how they portray uh, certain groups of people. So in terms of us, in terms of this context, how does that help uh, uh, media reporting, how does that help in terms of um, Albanian and Serb uh, relations per se. Um, I'm especially delighted that uh, this event is happening, um, is being hosted at um, AUK, so at RIT Kosovo AUK, uh, not just because I'm part of the team and I'm, um, I've been here for several years, but also because 
I think it is one of the rare models in higher education that we could actually use and learn from in Kosovo. Um, it is a university that has, um, has been able to overcome these differences and bring together students that come from Albanian backgrounds, from Serb background, Bosnian, Roma, Shkallian, Egyptians, and pretty much all of the minorities present in Kosovo. Uh, we don't consider that the work is done because we're aware that diversity needs to be tackled a bit more and there are special um, initiatives and activities that are done in that aspect, but this is the focus and therefore I'm really um, glad that this has been opening up here. Um, without further ado, I would like to, um, to ask uh, one of our colleagues, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mark Baskin. Uh, he's a public policy lecturer here at AUK. Uh, he has also had extensive experience in the region, not just Kosovo, but also in the region in terms of uh, being part of international missions. So he knows firsthand the importance of, uh, of this topic. And therefore, I would uh, kindly ask him to um, say a couple of words and make some opening remarks on behalf of AUK team. Thank you, Adar. Um, I don't really have too much to say, just to say that it's really I mean, I was asked here as a colleague to go and just to say a few words, welcoming you all to AUK or now RIT Kosovo, uh, where we deliver the kind of university education that's taken from the U.S. model. It's very specifically taken from the Rochester Institute of Technology, which is in upstate New York, which uh, you may be familiar with. And I think that it's particularly fitting that RIT Kosovo is hosting this conference on the social identity of youth in Kosovo. Um, because our student body is comprised of students from 17 different countries. We have people of all uh, various <coughs> ethnic groups, uh, various kinds of identity. We have uh, people from the United States. We have people from uh, every country in the region. Uh, we have people from Macedonia. Roma, etc., as Adona said. So that, and everyone is evaluated, of course, by the same standards of excellence. The, the, we use the same syllabi, and, the, and, um, and so that's that's what we do. Now, I just want to say, as someone who's been coming to the former Yugoslavia for four decades now, it's, um, since I first studied in Zagreb, is that, and, and I did my early work actually on ethnic identity and nationalism in the former Yugoslavia. And that I think that today's program is a really interesting kind of continuation of something that had been stopped. There was a tremendous uh, tradition of research of uh, scholars like Dragomir Pantic in Belgrade and of Jeren Kantonaric in, in Zagreb and many, many others who have looked at these kinds of issues. And so it's really good to see that this is continuing in a new way. And what's particularly good about this project is that from what I've seen about it, is that the findings are not just, it's not just research, but that it's meant to have some kind of practical effect. And so that's a, that's a particularly good thing. And so if I can just, before I step off, say um, a little advertisement for a program that we have here at RIT Kosovo, which is a summer program, <laughs> and post counts of transformation, of which I'm sadly the director <laughs> this summer. And, um, and it brings together Again, students and participants from uh, all, all over the region and from all over the world, in fact. And um, you'll have an opportunity to take courses in the process, various dimensions of the process, process of concept transformation from people who were high-ranking diplomats as well as well-known academics, both from, from AUK uh, and from uh, Europe and the United States. So if any of you are looking for something interesting to do, uh, we would welcome you to John and see uh, the results of that. So thanks very much for taking the time to listen, and I welcome you here. Thank you. Before I pass on the floor to Nita Bilikvashi, who's going to talk about the regional research uh, platform, 
I would just like to draw your attention to the material that is uh, provided for you at, um, well, at the entrance of the auditorium. This is our policy brief, and it relates to what Mark was saying, also to the, this idea that this research that we've done is not about just doing research, but it's also about making it relevant to policy making. So, um, and it, it also includes uh, regional results, so not just results from Kosovo, but also from other countries which we don't have the chance to have here today. Some of those results are presented there, so you are welcome to help yourselves uh, in between when we have a cocktail session outside uh, to help yourselves with the materials. There you also have all the copies of the presentations that are going to be shown today, so just so that you know. Okay, I'll pass the floor now to uh, Ms. Nita Bilibosh.
but also they expose uh, their work, they present their work, and they are exposed to, to a critical view that it is providing. Mm -hmm. And about the policy dialogue uh, initiative, uh, this is uh, a project of RRPP which aims at linking research and policy making and uh, making different relevant actors working together, such as uh, researchers, universities, ministries, parliaments, uh, media, uh, think tanks, and other uh, civil society organizations. Um, RRPP focuses on, on social sciences and supports the West and Balkan countries um, and tries to fill in some gaps that uh, researchers face in, in these countries, such as uh, limited state funding. We all know that uh, Western Balkan countries, uh, the, the GDP uh, devoted to, to science and research in Western Balkan countries is, is, is extremely low. And uh, the RPP provides grants or provides financial support uh, to, to researchers from the region. It also, um, one of the other reasons is also the lack of institutional infrastructure, especially at uh, public universities, and the consideration that research is a private matter of, of a motivated professor or a motivated individual. Um, also, uh, it's also one of the other reasons is also uh, the other difficulties that young researchers uh, face to advance and to, 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 to persuade they, their um, academic career. Um, the, others, the, the other uh, reasons are uh, the lack of, of communication between uh, scientific institutes and uh, civil society organizations and uh, also the link uh, with policy making uh, process and the policy makers. And also a very problem that especially in Kosovo we have is also the very administrative and bureaucratic procedures at the universities to, to conduct uh, we have done an internal, internal evaluation. We asked the people that were engaged since 2008 uh, with the RRPP, um, and uh, we wanted to, to uh, have their, their opinion on, on, the, on this program. And we were very happy to see the results that uh, responding 80% 80, 80 of the responding researchers said that this program has helped them to stay in the country and work in the, and not leave the region. And also, uh, it was very, very nice to, to hear that uh, this program has helped them and, and the funding has gave them the opportunity to, to conduct research uh, on, on the relevant topics. And also, um, the capacity building uh, pillar was also very highly evaluated, which um, they, they said that similar training were not offered in, in these countries in, at the universities or to mention at the very beginning that we just got an email today confirming that we have also won another grant for 
internationalization of these results as outcomes from this project. So activities that include not just what Nita was referring to, um, international conferences, but also international publishing. So this is very good for, for um, this research and also for the team. What I'm going to show you now is the portion of the research per se uh, in uh, Kosovo. Um, as you will see in the policy briefs, and as you will see if you take a look at uh, more closely at um, the research itself, it talks about two uh, concepts that derive from social psychological literature. So I'm going to spend a bit more time explaining what that means so that you get an understanding of how this was actually operationalized in the research. And then I'm going to present some of our results, some of the main results that pertain to this presentation today. It doesn't, the, the, the presentation doesn't include everything that we've measured because we really have a vast uh, a number of variables, but these are the most interesting one in terms of intergroup relations. Um, so, um, if we were to think about Kosovo's context and identity issues, um, and I'm sure the Yoza and Nitsa is something that would interest my dear colleague who's present here today, Desnik Bislimi, who's also the deputy at the parliament. This is really relevant for you. <laughs> so, I mean, if you think about Kosovo, and if, if you think about the, the stage that we're at in terms of identity development, um, I guess we could all agree saying that we are in a process where we're actually making sense of who we are in the sense of who is this new we, who is this new Kosovo identity, the new national identity that has been created after independence. Um, this is because, um, I mean, if you think about the, the, the history and the conflict, our ethnic identities were pretty much the most important identities group-wise. So for Albanians, yes, but also for Serbs. But now with the creation of a new national identity, the whole idea is that people come together <coughs> under this common roof and they find ways to actually overcome the differences and reconcile with what has happened in the past. And of course this is not an easy task to do. It has proven to not be an easy task in other countries as well, but especially in Kosovo because it's more recent. So conflict here was, was completed uh, rather recently compared to other countries that were involved in the project. But if you think about it from the social psychological perspective, um, this context uh, specifically is interesting identity-wise because of the high segregation between the groups. I mean, even if we compare our data, and as you can uh, see in the, in the brief that you have outside, Kosovo stands out in terms of the lack of intergroup contact that exists between Albanians and Serbs. Kosovo also stands out in terms of the negative attitude that groups have about each other. So pretty much it also stands out as a context in the sense that things are far from being perfect. Things are really hard and we need to, as, as researchers, as academics and as people who are interested into really making a difference in practice, because I think that's the whole point of, uh, end point of doing research, is that we need to find ways to actually make it relevant to people's lives. And I'm not saying it's an easy task, of course it's, it's not, and we don't have a solution yet, but at least this research and other research that uh, are being done in this aspect shed some light into understanding these intergroup phenomena. The other point why Kosovo, are, uh, why Kosovo as a context is particularly interested is because the new national identity is still under development. So unlike other countries where the state already existed, so the national identity was already there, here it's something completely new. So people need to make sense of what this whole identity means to them. And what it means to an Albanian not necessarily means the same to a Serb. And as you will see in a bit, it really does not. So how do we make sense of that? And how do we make it seen to people so that it is inclusive of all ethnic groups? Because what we find in practice is that this is not the case. So even though it has been um, evolved and it has been 
um, ideated as an identity that brings people together, it is not serving that purpose currently. And that's why it's important. To, to add to that, um, yes, please join us. No, I'll leave directly. So, uh, sorry, this is our colleague joining us from uh, Macedonia, Ali Payaziti. So the other point important to uh, in the, the other important point to make here about national identity being under development is that it is a crucial point in time when we can act, when we can actually make a difference when we can actually affect how it is being developed and actually affect how it is being perceived by these various groups. So that's why I would reiterate once again that this is of practical um, importance as well. When we think about identity and in social psychological literature and what you will see in the upcoming slides, we talk a lot about social identities. But to someone who doesn't come from this area, they might wonder, okay, so what is social identity and how does that differ from the identity that we're used to talk about? Social identity refers to the part of ourselves that is defined by our group membership. So whenever we categorize ourselves as, let's say, a woman or a mother or an Albanian or a Kosovar or a, a member of, of a certain political party or a certain organization, we are categorizing ourselves and we are putting ourselves into one of the social identities that, that are important to us. And what this does is that it is not only descriptive of ourselves, our social identities are not descriptive of ourselves, but also they give meaning to how we behave when we feel as if we're part of a group. So whenever we act as an Albanian, we don't act individually as an individual Albanian, but we act upon the concept of what Albanian stands for in this given certain context. Or the same, the same uh, um, example would be given for a Serb or a Bosniak, or a Varani, etc. So, and the implication in terms of intergroup relations is that the mere um, process of categorizing, categorizing ourselves into a certain group makes us feel distinctive from others. So whenever we categorize ourselves based on us, or as we refer in social psychological literature as in-groups, we automatically create or evaluate ourselves in terms of the differences or similarities that we have towards others, which is them more, more uh, often, or the outgroups. Now, there's a vast uh, number of research done for the past decades showing that this is crucial because it, the, the way we categorize ourselves into us or them, and the minute we do that, uh, has important uh, important implications in terms of intergroup attitudes and intergroup evaluations. So whenever we think about us, it's usually that we tend to put positive notes to it, positive evaluations. We're of course positive, we're good, we're moral, we're, um, I don't know, we're, we're competent, etc. And most importantly, we view our groups as being heterogeneous, meaning that there are good people between Albanians, but there are also bad people between Albanians. But what happens when we, when we, when we evaluate out groups or whoever we consider as them, is that we tend to view them as less positive. And when there is intergroup conflict or intergroup um, problems, we even tend to do this very negatively, so evaluate them very negatively. Of course, less moral, less good than us, less competent than us. Them is something different. And most importantly, we view them as one category that is homogeneous. So when it comes to thinking about them, all Serbs are the same. And you can also hear this in the discourse that we have in our everyday life. And of course, the, the examples could also be opposite. I mean, a Serb could say, us is, you have good Serbs and bad Serbs, but them, Albanians, is that all Albanians are the same, uh, regardless of what, how bad they are. Um, okay, so the way we uh, look specifically at this problem of social identities and the degree to which people identify with, uh, specifically with nationality, ethnicity, and religion within these four countries included in the project, 
is that we were interested to also make not just ethnic comparison, but also make comparisons or choose specific contexts where these ethnicities also differ in terms of minority majority statuses. So that's why, as you will see in a bit, we've chosen in each country two cities where the national majority, in this case in Kosovo, Albanians are the majority, such as Pristina, but also we've chosen another city, such as Mitrovica, where the national majority is a local minority. So Albanians being a minority in North Mitrovica. Um, the reason why we did that is because we were also interested to know what if this would also have an effect. So if being a majority or a minority at the national level would be different or would mean something different and would have an effect to being locally a, mo a majority or a minority. So the, 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 the um, questions that we focused our research on is how complex or how inclusive are these social identities and I'm going to define these in a bit. And what does this inclusiveness of others or this acceptiveness of others who are different from us depend upon? What decides how inclusive we are or less inclusive we are. And then of course, most importantly, how do these social identifications relate to intergroup relations per se? The theoretical framework that we draw uh, from um, touches two constructs, or draws upon two theories, called social identity complexity, um, which actually looks at how complex social identities are. So if you imagine yourself having a lot of social identities or having a lot of these group memberships that you identify with that become salient in one context but not necessarily the other, the idea is that we also have this capacity to combine or to have multiple identities at once. And research is showing that this multiple identification is actually benefiting how we evaluate others that are or are not part of these identifications or part of these groups. So to put it in a theoretical perspective, someone who has a low complexity means that that person is really rigid in terms of how he or she defines his identity. So for a person who has this yellow highlighted part on the lower um, left part of you, uh, on lowest complexity, this would be that if a person has, has a, a social identity that is this low, then he defines his identities and he also includes others as part of in-groups, only people who fulfill all of these three categories. So only if someone else is an Albanian, only if someone else is a Kosovar, and that someone else is a Muslim. Uh, if a person who is being evaluated does not fulfill any of these criteria, then he or she is automatically considered an outgroup. And this is very low complexity. And it's not, it, research has been showing that complexity has a lot of, I mean, people who are low in complexity have a lot of negative evaluations for others. The opposite of the continuum is high complexity. This is where people have more flexible way of identifying or, or of shaping their identities. So instead of identifying with just being Albanian or with just being a Kosovo or with just being a Muslim, they have this sort of overarching identification and therefore they're accepting of others regardless of whether they fall into one category or the other. And this is referred to as high complexity. Inclusiveness is another way how complexity is measured, but apart from giving a, a sort of an explanation of how a person's identity is shaped, it goes a step further because it also tells you to what extent that person is acceptive of others or is inclusive of others. And to, to give you a bit of a, a grasp on that, I'm going to show you how that was operationalized <coughs> soon. Um, generally speaking, we've used a mixed method design for this research, so we've done a quantitative portion of our studies in all four countries. The one that uh, includes Kosovo was done in Pristina and North Petrovica. We've had a sample of 228, uh, where we, we did quota sampling by ethnicity, gender, education, and student stand status, meaning that we've tried to keep or to attract the same numbers throughout the samples in all countries so that when we make comparisons, they are, uh, they are the same and there's no significance um, that would fall out of uh, the sample. 
from a qualitative study also included uh, a portion of our study that followed our quantitative part. So apart from gathering information about how this is, we were also interested to see what was the meaning that people give when they talk about being Albanian or Kosovar or being a Serb or being an Orthodox. So it was important for us to sort of detackle the, the underlying meaning. And in order to do this, we did uh, one focus group per city, per chosen city. So in Kosovo, this was two focus groups. One focus group with Albanians in Pristina and one with Serbs in, in North Mitrovica. And then we've also had two case studies. So we've, um, we've selected two people who, according to our criteria, had very high social identity complexity. So if you were to go back to here, they were up there, meaning that they had these broad categorizations of how they view themselves, and therefore we use them as potential candidates to tell us what has actually made them such, so what has made them stand out from, from uh, the rest of the crowd. Uh, the person that we've chosen for this is a person who converted religion from Muslim to Catholic, which was an interesting uh, point of view, and also another person who comes from a mixed Albanian Serb marriage, and her story was specifically um, interesting to us, telling us about how she was brought up and how she became this this uh, this open-minded uh, and this complex because of the way that she was brought up. And I'm going to have some quotes on that. Um, like I said at the beginning, we've had a very long questionnaire, a lot of variables, but I'm going to show you today only some uh, couple of those. There are main ones. The first one is we measured the extent of identification with a number of social identities. So we wanted to know to the extent to which people identify with being Albanian, being Kosovar, being European, being a member of a certain city, etc. Then we measured this construct of social identity complexity, so whether one is perceived to have more or less overlap between one's identities. And the way this was measured was with this item. So people were asked, when you think about people who are citizens of Kosovo, how many of them are Albanian? And then they were asked to choose from 1 to 11. 1 would be not a, not none, and then 11, all of them are. And then vice versa. When you think about people who are Albanian, how many of them are citizens of Kosovo? So the whole point is to give you an idea, to give us an idea of how people see Kosovo and Albanians as overlapping. They overlap a lot, in which case they have low complexity, or they overlap a little and they have high complexity. Um, when it comes to inclusiveness, uh, this was an extension of this construct, and we measured this by a specific, a specific uh, measure. Uh, we've shown uh, these cards that were specifically uh, tailored for each country. Uh, when, uh, when we asked participants at the beginning of the study, they told us our gender, they had to take, this was an online study by the way, and the minute they chose the gender, then the shadowed profile would also change according to the gender, so that there is no gender effect there in terms of the evaluation that they make. They were shown 24 cards, and the interesting point about these cards is that they are randomly shown, but they also change in terms of uh, what they include. So. If a person was seeing a card that has that includes all of one's in-groups or all of one's expected in-groups, then that card would be a high, a, a, this profile of a woman saying that this person is a citizen of Kosovo, has Albanian ethnicity, is of Muslim religion, and we would also put an Albanian name, so let's say a Dona Maluku in this case. But then on the other hand, there were also cards that Change if you can notice this card. So this is a person from Kosovo, but is of Serbian ethnicity and also is of different religion. And we were particularly interested to see how people would evaluate these cards. These cards where you are under the Kosovar overarching um, or under the common roof, uh, sort of symbolically speaking, but whether you include this person as part of your in-group or not. And what we find is this is not really the case. So they were randomly shown and people had to tick as to whether this was us or them. Yes, so us or them. Um, this is what they had to choose. And 
then we also measured a couple of other variables, the results of which I'm going to show you. So the extent to which they have frequency of contact, the extent to which there is social distance or not with all group members, and also how they feel about these all groups. Feeling being done with a measure of the so-called thermometer feeling or thermometer measure where you evaluate from 0 to 100 whether you feel cold or you feel warm towards a specific group. And this is um, the, the first part of the result showing the importance of social identities. Um, what, when we measured or when we actually analyzed um, how these identities differed in terms of Albanians and Serbs, we found that there is a significant difference between Albanians and Serbs rate uh, or identify with the country that they live in. So Albanians being higher in that, for them it's more important as an identity. Ethnicity is also more important as an identity to Albanians and gender as well. But also interestingly, perhaps for sort of policy making and um, yeah, future activities and all the orientation towards Europe is the difference between how Albanians and, and, and Serbs identify with Europe and that is that Serbs identify significantly less with Europe than um, Albanians do. Um, here I should point out because this is also something that keeps coming up in other results as well in this specific study, we measured nationality with, uh, with the, the, the saying or the declaration as country I live in, because we had to also analyze it or compare it with other countries. So in this case, we find that there is a, a pretty much higher identification of Serbs with country I live in, compared to a similar line of studies that we've done, where we've measured specifically how Serbs identify with the Kosovar identity. So there we specifically said the extent to which you feel Kosovar. And there this was really much lower. So I, I have to note that, because it seems that the implication here is that what Serbs was referring to is actually Kosovo as part of Serbia. And that is the country that, uh, that Serbs live in and identify with. And that's the difference that we that we find. Uh, when we take a look at complexity, we find that, and this is also something that we find throughout other countries as well, that generally speaking, the minority, or the Serbs in this case, have a more complex identities. So they have less perceived overlap between their nationality and between their ethnicity. And this is also understandable because they're numerically smaller, so to them, cognitively, or I mean, they are aware that not all Serbs are Kosovar and not all Kosovars are Serbs. But for Albanians, this is not the case. They are very low in complexity, meaning that there is a high, high overlap between the identity of the Albanian, of the Kosovar, and of the Muslim identity. Importantly, when we take a look at the extent to which people are ready to include others in their sense of identity, so take a look at these tasks where they have to categorize the, the card that I just shown you, we find that there's a higher inclusiveness among Serbs. And this is atypical, atypical compared to other countries, because in other countries we find that the majority is more inclusive. So they are more willing to accept others that differ in these categories. But again, relating to the result presented earlier, it seems like the Serbs here, when they included others, so when they included persons who were Kosovar and, um, and Serbs and Orthodox or Albanian and Muslim, they were referring to, to the card per se or to Kosovo per se as a country that is part of Serbia. So therefore, their inclusiveness uh, seems to be higher. <coughs> okay. Now, what we are able to also get from these data is to take a look at specifically um, and also sort of in a picturesque way to understand what is the structure of identities. And we find that for both parties, so for both um, ethnicities, <coughs> F, the, their identities are shaped primarily in the ethnic form. So for an Albanian, same as for a Serb, they will primarily consider someone else if that person shares the same ethnicity or not. All anything else is irrelevant. It's irrelevant for you whether you come from the same um, from
from the same country or irrelevant whether you come from the same or a different religion. So ethnic dominance is, is um, the first one. The second one, which is also um, really interesting, is that uh, we find that there's a very, very rigid way of, of shaping identities. And this is in both cases. But the difference here is that for Albanians, the, the intersection or the way that they shape identities and also categorize others is by the means of whether they share the same ethnic identity and nationality, or whether it goes even further, whether they shape, shape this, um, they share the same ethnicity, nationality, and religion. So a person has to fulfill all three criteria in order for someone to consider him or her as part of an in group. If a person falls in any of these categories, so let's say a person is an Albanian but is from Albania, then he would be considered or she would be considered an outgroup automatically. This is what this graph sort of tells us. Um, the Serbs, on the other hand, has have the same intersection, but in their case, it's the intersection between ethnic and religious identity. So whenever they categorize someone as part of their groups, they see if they fulfill these two criteria, whether that person is of the same ethnicity and whether that person is of the same uh, religion. And I guess in a broader kind of sense, what we could say is that even historically speaking, uh, we tend to find or to, to explain identities uh, of Serbs as being more interlinked when it comes to ethnicity and religion. So there, the, the that religion is considered for Serbs as the backbone of ethnic identity, so they're quite intertwined. But for Albanians, this was not historically the case. Religion was not the backbone of ethnic identity, and therefore we find this difference between ethnic identity and um, also inclusion of nationality. Huh, why don't I see it here? Um, Now, to give you an idea of how deep this is, or how deep this ethnic consideration of people is in terms of identities, these are some of the quotes that we found in our qualitative research. Um, so people saying Albanian identity is the backbone of our thinking. Everything that we do, everything that, everything that we are comes from being Albanian. So it talks about identities being as something inborn, as something that are fixed and unchained. And this is really problematic because people cannot move forward if they think that they are born Albanian or if they think that they are born Serb because it connotates, um, I mean, deep and profound differences. And the same for Serbs. They say that the fact that I'm a Serb, I cannot change it even if I wanted to. I was born a Serb and that's it. Um, to give you an idea of uh, the extent to which they identify or the extent to which they relate to the Kosovar identity, the quote says, I'm not Kosovar, I'm a Serb. So again, reiterating ethnic dominance. I can accept the official document, but personally I will never accept the Kosovar identity despite the pressure on us to assimilate. Because this is how Serbs see it. If they become or if they identify with Kosovo, being Kosovar, then it's a sense of assimilation for them. Okay, uh, I see that I'm way out of time, and I'm sorry because I get really passionate when I talk about this topic. So I'm going to quickly run through some of the, um, the slides. This is another um, analysis that we've done where we show um, the differences or what causes or what shapes the, um, the inclusiveness of a person. And we find that if people are highly identified with one main identity, so highly identified as an Albanian or highly identified as a Muslim, then typically what you find is that you would have the tendency to be lower in inclusiveness or in including other people who differ because your idea is shaped in that singular aspect. Uh, how is this relevant to intergroup outcomes? Well, we find that less inclusive identities relate to more social distance and what our data suggests is that people are low in complexity and are low in inclusiveness. So this says that in this context we sort of have this, um, this territory where uh, there's a tendency to have social distance with group and also feel less warmth toward them. 
Same with complexity, it relates to more social distance and also less work. So both of these show that um, actually um, people are inclined to feel more detached from other groups if they find themselves in those ones. What our qualitative data also suggests is what we can also figure out from practice, that both groups uh, are highly um, show high in group bias. So when we asked them to talk about their groups, both of them said that my group is friendly and peaceful and honest and whatnot, but the other group is really inhumane, they're very deceptive, they're violent, etc. And we find these in both groups, so both Albanians and Serbs say this the same way. For both, there is severe lack of intergroup trust, so they don't trust each other, which is problematic, uh, practical, uh, from a practical point of view. And the main ob the obstacles are not just ethnic identity and religious identity, or the differences, because we have different uh, ethnic um, groups and also different religions, but what is becoming more and more problematic is also that uh, we are also building up another barrier, which is the language barrier. So now we have young people who don't speak each other's languages, and therefore it just sort of adds to the possible barriers that we have for having these, these intergroup um, relations improve. And of course, lack, serious lack of contact. And here Kosovo stands out in comparison to other countries as well. In Kosovo, um, we've had around 70% of Albanians saying that they've never had contact with a Serb, which is a really high figure, and it speaks about the high segregation that, it, that exists. If it occurs, then there is contact only in formal settings, so at work or other, I mean, other formal settings, but generally speaking, they say, it does work because we don't talk about politics. So again, quite sort of in a denial, um, you would say. So the conclusions, we have the ethnically dominated identities among both groups, <coughs> and these cause obstacles for reconciliation. Majority Albanians are little aware of the possibilities that there are other people living in Kosovo under the same roof, and this is something that we have to work on intervention-wise. The minority um, is aware of the non-overlapping identities, but in this case is atypically high in inclusiveness, meaning that we have to work on how they shape or how they see um, Kosovo. So consider Kosovo as what it is, a new state, and not as part of Serbia, because it's not helping. And then uh, negative intergroup evaluation, so lack of trust, high social distance, etc., and lack of contact, which maintains these intergroup boundaries. Can we move forward? <laughs> this is very hard, and these are really um, big challenges. But uh, we are we are confident, and we are um, we think that we can. But we need to find ways to actually do this. And two paths that were suggested, not just from here, but also from a parallel line of studies done. Uh, by, uh, done by, by uh, a team of Dutch researchers and myself. Uh, they talk about, um, the results say about this, this need to increase complexity among Albanians, so increase this awareness of Albanians that there are different identities and different people not really sharing those identities. But at the same time, what research is showing is that if we increase identification of Serbs with the new Kosovo, that this also improves their evaluations of Albania. So they tend to evaluate Albanians as in more positive light. Um, and this is something that we can think about. Um, okay, and I'll just conclude by how to do this uh, with uh, um, an important and meaningful um, statement that one of our case studies said. She said, Kosovar identity seems like a small version of the Balkans to me. It includes many ethnicities and many religions. I feel Kosovo as my state, and the Kosovo identity gives me the feeling of focusing on what we have now, not on the past, which I think is a really important message and something that we need to, to um, give uh, across, or to send across. So we can focus on this and not on what we used to be, whether Albanians or Serbs or whatever. I don't care about the background as this is who I am. That's it. Sorry for um, taking more time to actually say what I had to say. 
If you have any questions, you can email me or my, my colleague, Katrina Temendi, but you can also take a look at the website, and in the website, we've also incorporated the task with uh, the cards, and you can also uh, take one yourself and see how inclusive you are in your identities. Thank you. session by the way uh, which is a discussion session at the very end and that's why we're not asking for your questions just so that we think I mean just so that you don't think that this is weird or Uh, 
the, the uh, old uh, Skopje and the postmodern uh, Skopje, which is produced by uh, the actual uh, government and which is also called as very artificial uh, part of the uh, Skopje. Uh, and it is called from Newsweek uh, Wall Street Journal as a Legoland, Little Paris, Little uh, Roma, and Little uh, Vienna. And the uh, old traditional uh, part of Skopje or uh, uh, Albanian uh, part of the Skopje at the left side of the river uh, Var. Uh, but the hope, our hope is at the uh, young, at, uh, especially at the university uh, students. As you see here, there is a, uh, there is a uh, uh, citation from uh, our research. Uh, ethnic Macedonian girl from uh, Gostivar uh, saying that uh, I trust my friends so much, I love uh, Bakla, but I love most uh, uh, Ashura and I love the way Albanian people prepare it, which is a combination of three elements, uh, ethnic, religious uh, and uh, also the uh, third uh, element is that of uh, uh, national uh, identity because uh, Albanians and Macedonians live uh, in uh, Macedonia which is uh, the uh, state of all of us. Uh, the, uh, what is, why this uh, research is very important for uh, our society because we are post-conflict uh, society. We lived the conflict in 2001 and we are producing a new uh, reality from uh, multicultural society to uh, multicultural uh, uh, state. And we are facing uh, many problems in, in uh, this uh, way. Uh, because from 2006 uh, we are living in a, a new uh, reality. This is the third uh, Macedonia. If the, from uh, 1944 to 1991, it was the first Macedonia from 1991 uh, to uh, 2006. Second Macedonia from 2006, we uh, live in a partitocracy. Uh, the, the one uh, party which is governing the uh, state, it is former of the common air. And uh, the reflection of this negative uh, climate we face in uh, every day uh, life. And also at the uh, uh, university area, uh, also uh, we have uh, we have a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, message from Southeast European University, which is the uh, most European uh, uh, institution, uh, as Oli Rand said, in, in the uh, uh, Balkans. Uh, we have reality of uh, flexible use of languages. The teaching in Southeast European University is done in, in uh, Albanian, Macedonian, and in uh, English. But from uh, uh, two years ago, uh, we have also a community of uh, Turkish student, students coming from uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, and uh, the teaching is also done in the core uh, language. Uh, as for uh, uh, countries' uh, context, uh, in Macedonia, uh, demographically, uh, uh, the majority of the population of Macedonia are uh, ethnic uh, Macedonians, 64%, uh, 25% of uh, uh, the population uh, is uh, Albanian, and also uh, other uh, communities. We, we don't use the term minority because after the Ocrit framework, uh, agreement, uh, we uh, uh, use a new uh, term uh, which is the uh, communities uh, Serbs, Turks, Bosniaks, Vlahos, Roma, et, uh, etc. From the religious uh, perspective, uh, also uh, the ma majority of the uh, uh, population are uh, Orthodox Christians and a third of the population are uh, 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 Muslims. Uh, if we mix this uh, data, we can see a picture uh, where uh, uh, the uh, absolute majority of Albanians are uh, Muslims uh, and the uh, absolute majority of Macedonians uh, are Orthodox uh, Christians. Uh, 
this is uh, the reality of uh, political reality of uh, Macedonia, two sides of uh, Skopje, uh, Holiday Inn at the left uh, side, and uh, the slum, Gazibaba and Shuto Horizari at the uh, right uh, side, the uh, uh, tennis uh, court and the beam bumps uh, in the uh, Gazibaba Sokax. Uh, if you uh, look at the, at the uh, some research done uh, in the uh, uh, two or three years uh, before, we can see uh, research done by uh, by uh, UNDP, uh, in which uh, uh, myself uh, was a part of that uh, research. Uh, one of the questions was whether respondents uh, shops in stores owned by members of different ethnic uh, groups. And we see that, that, uh, that uh, there is a difference between ethnic, and, uh, Macedo uh, ethnic Macedonians and ethnic Albanians. Uh, a greater openness is uh, seen at the uh, uh, Albanian uh, community, uh, but the more transparent uh, are the uh, Turks and uh, Roma uh, uh, communities. Uh, Whether well, respondent patronize restaurants owned by members of different ethnic uh, uh, groups, uh, here the uh, situation is the, uh, say, more closed uh, 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 community is uh, uh, ethnic uh, Macedonian or uh, 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 this uh, dominant uh, community in the uh, Republic of uh, Macedonia. As for the sample of our uh, research, uh, the, the sample uh, is uh, uh, from uh, uh, 219 young adults from uh, Skopje, uh, from two cities, capital Sk uh, Skopje and uh, uh, Tetovo, the uh, second uh, city in uh, Macedonia. And uh, the age of respondent was from uh, 18 to uh, 35. Uh, ethnic Macedonians are majority in Skopje, while in Teto, major ethnic group is represented by uh, Albanians. And uh, results, it was found that Macedonians and Albanians uh, uh, prescribed different level of importance uh, on investigated social uh, groups. Uh, for uh, the uh, Skopje Albanians, the most important element of their uh, identity uh, is uh, religion, and after that, uh, uh, ethnicity. And for ethnic uh, young Macedonians, the most important uh, element uh, is nationality, it means uh, statehood, and after uh, that, uh, ethnicity, and the uh, third, uh, uh, nationality. And. Uh, as for communication, daily communication, uh, it is uh, more done at the uh, schools, at the university area, and at the uh, workplace, and not at the leisure or uh, free uh, time. The uh, communication among Macedonians and Albanians from both cities is uh, uh, rare representing evident separation among these groups in uh, everyday life. And this is the reason why Macedonia uh, is described as the divided uh, society, and Skopje, the capital, uh, also. I used a, a, a title uh, in one of my research, Capital Division and Ethno-Urbanization in Macedonian Bay for the case of Skopje 2014. And uh, uh, another result of uh, this research is that Albanian participants from Teto tend to hold tightly to their uh, identity, both ethnic and religious. So the uh, ethnicity is more important for uh, Albanians from Teto than for Albanians from uh, capital uh, Skopje. The, the uh, nationality is not important both for uh, uh, Macedon young Macedonians and Albanians, and uh, uh, the reason is the uh, economy or uh, finance. 
and they say that uh, they are ready to change their nationality if they uh, find the uh, war uh, abroad. And we, uh, in Macedonia, we uh, face uh, 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 the, the, the so-called phenomenon of uh, uh, brain uh, drain. Uh, young uh, adults that are ready to, uh, uh, to uh, go abroad or to emigrate in European uh, countries or USA, Canada and uh, Australia. <coughs> Uh, and the uh, uh, most important events for uh, event, uh, identification of the young uh, uh, Albanians and Macedonians uh, are the events uh, like uh, Eurosong, the uh, national uh, team uh, game in uh, football, uh, and uh, uh, Saturn. Uh, for many of uh, the, the respondents being uh, living in Macedonia, uh, is not uh, an imperative and it, it's not uh, so uh, important. And uh, they say that uh, I will leave out the country in terms of uh, employment and uh, uh, they are ready to change their uh, nationality uh, 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 as well. I prefer uh, every possible country better than Macedonia, preferring Switzerland, Germany, USA, uh, Female, Albanian female uh, unemployed from uh, Teton. And uh, uh, we can go to the uh, conclusions. Uh, as for uh, religion and uh, uh, optimism about the future, for uh, uh, Albanian religion is uh, very highly important. Uh, for Macedonians it's not the, the uh, same. 58% uh, uh, of uh, Albanians said that uh, their, their religion is important. For Macedonians that uh, only uh, 12 or 13% uh, percent of them said that uh, religion is an important element of their modus vivendi uh, lifestyle uh, and uh, worldview. Uh, about the uh, optimism uh, about the uh, future, uh, young Albanians are more optimistic than uh, young uh, Macedonians. Uh, as a conclusion, Albanian uh, participants express strong social identity as Albanians and as being Muslims. Compared to Albanians from Albania and from Kosovo, the Macedonian Albanian community identifies itself, uh, itself with two inseparable uh, elements, religion and ethnicity and uh, Albanianism. Uh, At the same time, they perceive clear distinction between us and uh, them. And Macedonian participants expressed relatively weak social uh, identity, but stated uh, that in fact there is coincidence of ethnicity and religion, that the individuals uh, identi uh, identify themselves with both groups together. Uh, this phenomenon is deeply rooted and uh, this, uh, thus it is almost impossible to make a, a conscious choice uh, or not to be perceived by the social environment as Muslim and Albanian or Macedonian and Orthodox at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ali. Actually, this finding that the minority groups tend to identify much more with the keen states where their ethnic groups are a majority, so Albanians with Albania or with Kosovo or Serbs in, in Bosnia identifying more with Serbia rather than uh, Bosnia. This is something that we find throughout. But to give us more insight in terms of how minority issues are in Kosovo specifically, I'd like to now ask um, Adi and Zicili to uh, present their work on this issue. I'm executive director of European Center for Minority Issues in Kosovo. 
DCMI, uh, the center is a German, Danish, oh, sorry. It's a German, Danish uh, organization uh, established in the 90s in the wake uh, of uh, wars in former Yugoslavia that uh, ravaged uh, this region uh, mainly based on ethnic uh, differences. Uh, the center was established in order to promote uh, research and to uh, promote uh, treatment of minority issues not as an issue of uh, territorial integrity or uh, as, a, as an issue of, uh, of a secessionism, but as an issue of uh, good governance and uh, human rights. So uh, the organization is uh, operational in Kosovo since 2001. And um, we deal with a lot of work, especially we work with institutions of Republic of Kosovo in designing a legal and institutional framework that will allow all Kosovo uh, communities, uh, minority communities, to enjoy their rights and uh, their, their entitlements. Um, I'm going to provide a short overview of uh, Kosovo, who are the Kosovo minority communities, some of the relationship uh, that they have with uh, Albanian uh, majority community. I'm going to try to explain uh, the Kosovo constitutional and legal framework that deals with minority communities uh, in uh, certain stages, especially the, 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 the constitutional provisions, the special rights, and local government uh, structures. So let me please start. Um, so uh, we'll move to uh, the multi-ethnic character of Kosovo. I think from all uh, states that have come out of a, a dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia, Kosovo is a special case for two reasons. One is that uh, all states that have come out from former Yugoslavia and that also this research covers, they have translated national uh, ethnic identity of the majority population within that state into a national identity. So Serbs of Serbia, Croats have done the same, Macedonians have done the same, Bosnians have also done the same to a large extent because the, the three divisions, the three uh, entities within Bosnia, they use uh, ethnic uh, uh, identities and then uh, they only uh, uh, cooperate with each other on, on, the, on, the, on the top level. Whereas in Kosovo, this has not been the case. Kosovo has engineered a new uh, identity, it engineered a, 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 a geographic identity, so to say, um, uh, with people that live there. And, and as we will see uh, in the next slides, uh, this has been enshrined into uh, the Kosovo uh, legal and, 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 and constitutional framework. Uh, the other uh, uh, element that distinguished Kosovo from other uh, states uh, that have come up with former Yugoslavia is that Kosovo is largely contested by its neighbors, especially by Serbia. So it's not recognized by Serbia, and, the, uh, and especially the relations between with the Serb community, as we will see, are very much strained by this non-recognition, which is not the case with other uh, 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 states that have come up from, uh, from Yugoslavia. We have the case of Croatia, Macedonia, Bosnia even, uh, where minorities that live within those uh, uh, states also recognize the, the states that they live in and also the king states that these states are uh, uh, neighboring recognize the existence of that state. That's why um, the, the element of analyzing the dynamics between Serb and Albanian uh, communities and, uh, in Kosovo should uh, uh, take into consideration these uh, open questions that uh, there remains, at least in the eyes of the Serb and the Serbian state in relation to Kosovo. Um, so Kosovo is, is defined, as we said, as a multi-ethnic state, uh, not as an ethnic state. It's a state, as you, I have given here two articles from the Kosovo Constitution, uh, which provide the definition of the state as a, uh, a state of its citizens. So, and these citizens, to use the layman words to try to explain how the uh, philosophy is behind, so Kosovo is a geographic territory, it is made up of citizens, and these citizens may be of different communities. And these communities all have similar stake on the, on the state. 
some of these communities are in numerical majority, some of these communities are in numerical minority. And, and that's why Kosovo doesn't employ, if you look at the Kosovo constitution, Kosovo legal framework, you will never find the word minority. Uh, although uh, my, our community is not in majority, uh, this is how the constitution was there referred to, uh, enjoy special right of minority international minority uh, from the instruments uh, are coming out of the international system and uh, instruments that, that protect minorities. But uh, within Kosovo law, they are not referred to as minorities. So this is a high, the highest level of protection of minority rights in any uh, state that there can be found. So, uh, uh, and, and, and this, uh, to give an example of how uh, Kosovo Albanian is open to it, it, it was willingly, uh, uh, it was willing to relinquish its very strong ethnic identity uh, to a more uh, uh, sort of a, a generic identity uh, as it is uh, the Kosovo state. So the complexity I was surprised to see some of the results. The complexity from the Albanian side are very high because they are willing to 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 uh, 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 to to let go their national uh, their ethnic identity for a national identity. Of course, uh, they have a bigger state, but it's still uh, uh, a huge step forward. Um, as you can see from the uh, Kosovo Constitution, uh, the definition of uh, communities. Uh, is that inhabitants belonging to the same national or ethnic, linguistic, or religious group traditionally present on the territory of Kosovo, meaning that anybody that self-identifies itself as a minority, as a distinct minority, is uh, actually, whether it's a linguistic group, whether it is a religious group, um, whether, it, whether it is a, 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 an, an, an ethnic group, is entitled to enjoy wide uh, uh, protection mechanisms uh, from, uh, from the uh, constitutional framework. So communities are not in majority. This is what, what I was just referring to. The word minority is, is, is not used in the Kosovo legal framework. Also when uh, uh, they are called not the majority. So again, uh, I, I'm not going to go through the law, but uh, uh, you are going to, uh, uh, you see the have handouts that uh, very wide definition of uh, minorities. So who are the uh, communities, uh, minority communities not in majority? These are Serbs, Turkic, Bosniak, Roma, Ashkali, Egyptians, Korani, and other communities. We will see that there was uh, an addition to these communities. There were the Croats that were recognized and Montenegrins that were recognized. Uh, this is reflected uh, the multi-ethnic character of the Kosovo society. And this definition that is given the, in, the, in, the, in the Constitution is reflected in everything that Kosovo society, Kosovo sort of is represented from the flag, from, as you can see, the flag here. It doesn't represent any ethnic elements uh, from none of the communities, even that of the majority community. So Albanians are one of the communities uh, in the Kosovo state. They are, of course, uh, they represent 19 to 95% of uh, people that live here. Um, and uh, I have uh, uh, presented, this is how the definition is, and uh, uh, I have presented areas where they are not in majority, uh, especially in, uh, in uh, Štrpce, Novogordo, Ranilu, Klokot, Leposavic, Lugupotov, Vechak, Gračanica, Mamusha, and North Mitrovica. Uh, this is Serb community, an estimated of 150,000 uh, inhabitants uh, uh, currently living in Kosovo, not those that were displaced or IDPs or whatever. Um, they are, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, their uh, religion, uh, and uh, the locations where they live mostly. Again, uh, the relationship with the Serb community, Serb non-majority community, uh, is uh, very uh, 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 distinct from the rest of the minority communities because uh, the, the, the uh, at large part, especially uh, uh, those that live in the northern uh, uh, part of Kosovo, they uh, largely do not recognize Kosovo as, as their uh, overall state and uh, have, uh, in fact, a very negative uh, approach uh, to it. This is not the case with, uh, with uh, 
research living south of uh, Iber River, uh, where uh, there has been uh, a much better integration and, uh, and uh, work with, uh, with the Kosovo institutions. The Turkish community um, uh, is another non-majority community. Uh, it is around 20,000 people. Uh, they are very well organized, especially because they have a very good relationship and support from their king state, the Republic of Turkey. Uh, and uh, they live in several cities, as you will see in the presentation. Uh, they are very much integrated into Kosovo society. They have no problem with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 living together with Albanian and other uh, minority communities in Kosovo. And um, they, they, they do have some uh, grievances in terms of usage of language, which is, uh, uh, legally it is recognized as, a, as an official language, but there are problems in implementation because, uh, as we all know, uh, language implementation also requires resources. Bosnia community is around 30,000 inhabitants, mainly living on uh, south, uh, west and west east of Kosovo. Um, they are predominantly Muslim Slavs, uh, and they have come together. And, uh, uh, they, they, they lived in the territory of Kosovo for centuries. Um, they are also very well integrated within the Kosovo society. Uh, politically, uh, they tend to uh, uh, take the. Uh, uh, politically, they are they are well represented into the Kosovo institutions, and uh, are. More or less, again, uh, there are uh, problems with usage of languages, especially as a Bosnian language, which is uh, uh, usually people refer to it as a Serbian language, but as we know, there is a difference now between Bosnian and Serbian language, and there is a problem in terms of uh, realizing their rights. Roma community, uh, again, uh, uh, one, one community which um, uh, is, uh, um, is, is, um, is, uh, is, 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 is fourth uh, in according to its size, uh, has a lot of problems, especially the social problems and uh, lack of education. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I think Roma problems, the problems of Roma communities that they face in Kosovo, they face all over Europe. And uh, the problems being of uh, social and, and, and economic integration of this community. Ashkali community, is a subdivision, is believed it's a subdivision of a Roma community, but of course, according to international law, you have a right to self-identification. After uh, the 99 conflict, uh, uh, they were recognized as a, as a, as a separate uh, community, and uh, they were, they were, uh, 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 they have been granted rights as a separate community. Anthropologically, they do, uh, Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian community belong to the same group of community uh, and uh, their uh, sort of distinction has come up as a result more of a, of a political differences in former Yugoslavia and in Kosovo after, uh, uh, after, after the war. Uh, Egyptian community, again, uh, the same uh, problems as, as Roma community. They are, uh, uh, as, as opposed to Roma community, they speak primarily Albanian, both Egyptians and, and Ashkali, and they have the uh, same economic and social problems. Gorani community is around 10,000. Uh, again, this is the margin of, of, of distinction between uh, Bosniak and Gorani community is very fluid. Uh, there is a big problem always in terms of uh, uh, who is a Gorani and who is a Bosniak. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, starting from the point of view that people have right to self-identification, uh, they, uh, some of them self-identify as Gorani, some of them self-identify as Bosnian. Uh, if you really look at it, the difference is political. So Gorani being more inclined to support Serbia and Serbian institutions, whereas Bosnia uh, being more inclined to work with Kosovo and Kosovo institutions. But they do speak uh, uh, the same sort of uh, language. Also, Gorani use an archaic form of uh, uh, of, a, of a language uh, which uh, I think needs to be studied, but it's an archaic form of a Balkan mixture of Balkan languages, predominant, uh, uh, predominated by Bulgarian uh, slash Macedonian uh, Bulgarian <laughs> uh, 
language. So, uh, so it's a, uh, 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 it's, but, but that's, that's, that's the, 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 the only difference. Uh, Montenegro community was just recently recognized in the, in the Kosovo uh, law. Uh, they are uh, one of the smallest community. Uh, again, uh, a subdivision. They used to be considered the same as the Serbs. But uh, ever since the independence of Montenegro, there have been uh, very good relations with uh, the state, the Republic of Montenegro. And they have been granted uh, an official status of our community, not the majority in Kosovo. Croat community, the same. Uh, they were recognized, uh, although they have been living in Kosovo uh, for, for, for centuries, um, uh, they have been just recently recognized. There used to be a, a much bigger, a bigger number of these communities, but now they are they are in a much uh, smaller smaller numbers, and they live in only two locations, two or three locations in Kosovo. Um, again, problems with unemployment. You have some figures here. I'm not going to uh, give you these uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, these, uh, these figures. Uh, challenges again. Uh, Kosovo per se is a country where there, uh, uh, lack of economic development is, uh, is, is affecting everybody, uh, uh, Albanians, but then that also affects uh, minority communities uh, as well. Um, let me just uh, say uh, what, why minority rights uh, are important and where do uh, they stand for. Uh, so there are two theories of, uh, of uh, how people are granted uh, uh, rights within the state. There's the theory of human rights and non-discrimination. So everybody has human rights, and those human rights are applied uh, across the board to everybody uh, on a non-discriminatory <coughs> way, and that's it. This is the French model. And then there is the model where uh, people are granted special rights because uh, there are some groups within the society that cannot realize their rights as would the majority uh, uh, population. And this is the sort of a more uh, uh, European uh, approach uh, to, uh, to, to minority rights, where you grant special rights on special areas, especially culture, uh, 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 language, uh, education, uh, sometimes also local self government uh, and in Kosovo, we have a combination of all, uh, and, um, uh, and I'm just going to give very brief, if, if, if I have, on uh, special rights and local government structures rights that minority communities enjoy. Uh, we talked about the overall construction of the state as the first level of protection. The second level of protection are special rights, which are only granted to minority communities. And then there is a special mechanisms that uh, make local government uh, suited to uh, minority communities. So uh, uh, here is a list of special rights that minority communities have, uh, from guaranteed seats in the Assembly of Kosovo, uh, uh, vital special, uh, vital interest procedures in the Assembly of Kosovo, uh, 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 mandatory representation of minority communities in the government of Kosovo, including the position of deputy prime minister, um, in the judicial system, special mechanisms in representation, consultative mechanisms like uh, communities consultative council, and so forth. So uh, uh, these are some of the institutions on the central level that deal with uh, minority communities directly. Uh, you will see here listed in this uh, chart. Uh, these are some of the institutions on the local level. Uh, and uh, yeah, under discrimination language rights, again, an area where extensive rights have been granted to non-majority communities, especially Serbian uh, language. Uh, economic and social opportunities also uh, 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 widely covered in the, in the, in the, in the Kosovo law. Uh, third, and the last one is local government structures. Almost 90% of Serb community live in the areas where they constitute majority in that particular municipality. So there has been redrawing of borders so that minorities, especially Serb community, is represented uh, adequately on the, on the local level. There is an asymmetric devolution of power. So uh, these municipalities have 
uh, more rights that other municipalities have, for example, Albanian majority municipalities, so there is an asymmetric uh, devolution of power that has been delegated to these municipalities. And then there is special right of these municipalities to cooperate with each other. This is what the Vita is all about, uh, and uh, what, what uh, currently uh, there is the debate. How this will be shaped is the big debate right now in Kosovo. And it's, it's, it is a good debate because it touches upon uh, the very essence and the constitutional order of the Republic of Kosovo. If you are going to, uh, so if you are going to grant autonomy to uh, these municipalities, then the, what we mentioned from the beginning, the overall construction of the state and the special right <coughs> doesn't have any meaning. They were given there so that there isn't uh, territorial autonomy uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the local level. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, then, uh, you know, they, in the beginning, they wanted to avoid Bosnia model, to create entities based on ethnicity, and <coughs> because they wanted to avoid Bosnian model, they reshaped and engineered Kosovo in this special way. And now there is a tendency to uh, create entities in Kosovo. This will then run country to the overall logic that was used when designing uh, Kosovo constitutional and state framework. So, uh, yeah, I will stop here. I know uh, I, I, I will talk a lot. Maybe we will have opportunities another time. But, uh, yeah, this is, in short, uh, the uh, very brief presentation of what is a very complex situation of minority communities in Kosovo. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is very interesting and actually an, an, an eye-opener from for me as well um, because I deal a lot with it from my perspective so it's really interesting. If you want to take a look at the handouts of all the presentations again once it, I mean you have them um, outside the auditorium and now I'd invite you to um, get some refreshment. We have a 15 minute break uh, outside where we have food and drinks for you so please like yourselves and then we'll come back in 15 minutes where we have the two concluding presentations as well. Thank you. We have less people of course <laughs> being the second panel and being that we've uh, well, extended the first session a bit. Um, I'm pleased to be joined now by Venera Chochai, who's going to present what the Youth Initiative for Human Rights Kosovo do, a very active organization that uh, works on reconciliation um, activities between Albanians and Serbs, among others. And then we're going to conclude with Eraldin Pazdiu from Kosovo 2.0 in terms of how media help shape uh, the narrative about the others or other groups. So I'll pass the floor now to Venera. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Venera, I'm a program coordinator at Youth Initiative Human Rights, which is in Pristina based office. We are a grassroots activist human rights organization based in uh, almost all of the West Balkan, including Belgrade, Podgorica, Sarajevo, and Zagreb. This tells also a lot about of, uh, our approaches and the way how we think and how we deal with the recent past, and that's uh, exclusively through regional, uh, regional approach. So when we talk about uh, uh, Kosovo, what's happening in Kosovo, and how we um, introduce human rights to our activists, it's always uh, with practices and phenomena that are happening also in the other West Balkan uh, countries. So. Uh, Last year, we, uh, at uh, December, we conducted the research. Uh, we wanted to know um, uh, how much actually uh, youngsters focusing only on Albania and Serbia know about each other. We usually can, uh, can hear arguments that, oh yeah, they don't know each other, they speak different language, it, it doesn't matter, it's too divided. But we still want to measure that. We had some kind of assumption what kind of results they will be, but it's different when you can actually have some kind of uh, percentages and you can, in that kind of way, you can also orient your activism and your work through positive social changes. Uh, 
So yeah, that was some of the my main idea and the purpose to see what kind of uh, information they possess, what kind of stories, impressions, prejudice, um, especially focusing their knowledge of the recent past. But we covered the whole territory, and the questionnaires were both avail available in Romanian and in Serbian language. So the uh, first question, maybe some will say it was a panel question, but after we had the result, we saw that it was a very necessary question, and this was, have you ever met an Albanian or a Serb in Kosovo? So 60% uh, of uh, Albanian youngsters in Kosovo, they have never had a chance to meet a Serb in, in, in Kosovo. So uh, that was pretty shocking for us. And then you have 70% of uh, Kosovo Serbs who have a chance to meet an Albanian in Kosovo. So, of course, the population and the statistics are an advantage that uh, Albanian are a minority, so you are like a minority, have a bigger chances to meet. But still, it reshapes the argument that the Kosovo Serbs don't want to integrate, they isolate themselves, and all those um, uh, narratives that we usually confront when we want to reshape nationalism in our state. After that, we have like, okay, if you meet, meet them, how often is that? And you can also see that a uh, few times per week, you have like 5% of Albanians who had a chance to meet a Serb few times per week, and 47 Kosovo Serbs who had a chance to meet Albanian few times per week. Uh, so this is one, one for us was one of the most important questions because uh, it was an open question. We asked them, so what what kind of reason? What do you think that you didn't have uh, the chance to meet them to have a uh, friend from a different ethnic background? Uh, so we we had a lot of uh, answers and we tried to categorize in different kind of groups. Uh, we have uh, we had answers such as family loss. I have a my personal tragedy, I'm too emotional to handle this kind of um, friendships. Then we have someone who doesn't, didn't have such a family loss, but generally the consequences of not dealing with the past, uh, seeing the other as an enemy, prejudice, hate, etc. But for us, this was a spark of hope because most of them uh, had this kind of uh, logic uh, answer. It was, well, they are simply not here, they're not around us. And uh, when we say ethnic barriers, we also mean like cultural habitus and the language that is not spoken. As someone said earlier that the younger generation do not do not speak um, uh, Serbian. Uh, um, and also, if you go to the past, uh, in the past, in the past time, in previous systems, uh, the Kosovo Albanians had learned with uh, Serbian Croatian, but the Slavic states never had the chance to learn Albanian language. And now today, uh, even though the we have a segregate education system. One of the big gaps is that, that there is no kind of uh, intercultural communication. I will not even go and be ambitious to learn each other's language, but even not uh, at least uh, learning some uh, basic uh, basic things from me, from each other. But uh, ha having these statistics and these answers, I, maybe we can um, have this kind of uh, ambitious and optimistic conclusion that maybe our youth just uh, need a, a space a space where they can actually have this kind of intercultural communication and not always assume that uh, you would want to, uh, to communicate with each other because they have prejudice and hate with each other. Uh, coffees, coffees uh, coffee shops are places that we usually never think about uh, <laughs> which ethnicity we belong, but in Balkans we can be assured that it's different. I will take example in Croatia, where uh, I'm from, uh, Vukovar is uh, the city of my parents, but they immigrated in Kosovo. And today, Vukovar is a divided city, but if you go in Mitrovica, the division is also physically by the river of uh, Ibar. But in Mitrovica, uh, in Vukovar, the, you don't have such a physical uh, division. But again, if you go, you know exactly which uh, cafe go Croats and which go Serbs. So um, uh, we have 84% of Kosovo Albanians who never been in a cafe where Serb youth gather. And the other chance, uh, in other side, we have uh, almost 68% of uh, Serbs who have actually been in a cafe with Albanian youth gathered. So we are uh, uh, shaking again the nationalist arguments that Serbs don't like to be part of the Kosovo society. So we, we manage the language. So the most frequent uh, uh, answer of Kosovo youth, they, they uh, know up to 10 words of each other official languages. 
which is still uh, a, a big gap. And this is one of the things that we always um, when we talk about institutional responsibility and how to achieve an inclusive society is absolutely uh, um, learning the both uh, two of both official languages. Um, so how prejudice comes? So obviously, I'm really glad that we taught his colleague from Costa 2.0, so we can also see how media can directly influence the mindset of, of the youngsters. So uh, we ask like um, a really simple question. So. Do you know any public personality of, of Albanian or Serb ethnicity? So from from Albanian side, we most of the most famous person that we heard the name was Zeta. Uh, so we were like, okay, Zeta was the absolute winner. Uh, but by category, the politicians were uh, predominantly the one who were known from the uh, Albanian and Ser Serbian side. Uh, and the field of culture, writer, musician, and art. They are really, really a low percentage, almost not up to 2%, where politicians are up to um, 60%. And politicians who, uh, who are today in power are the same people who in the 90s had been infiltrated in different kind of political movements or being in the field directly during the combat. So if he, those people who, are, who in the 90s were uh, part of the recent uh, conflict and today are in the power, then we are really facing and we have a problem dealing with the past because the ones who are in power are not allowing to do it us properly. Today on Kosovo we still learn in history books that all the victims, all the people who die are Albanian ethnicity, even though that we have many documents from Humanitarian Law Center, from uh, Red Cross that say other things, that there are actually uh, civilians who are non-Albanian. I'm really glad to say that um, two days ago we had a street action on the main square when we commemorate the National Day of Missing Persons and we put the whole name of the civilians without any uh, ethnic division. And um, I was there from, from 12 till 9 and people were coming by, mostly youngsters, and uh, they had a very interesting comments. One of those was like, so I don't understand, is this for Kosovo? I was like, yeah, these are the whole, uh, whole peop people who, have, who are still disappearing. So, and then the question was, but why are there Serb names? So we still have a youth who cannot comprehend uh, Kosovo as a society which is uh, multi-ethnic and not mono-ethnic. Um, and yesterday we had, a, 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 you can, we can hear, we, yesterday was um, a TV show where Tom Gashi, a lawyer, was uh, a part of it, and he used a very offensive term to describe Serbs. So this morning we react with a public, public letter to media that using such terms, especially if you're a lawyer and you are committed to the equal treatment of all citizens and uh, calling a Serb community with the offensive term is not acceptable. But uh, after that, uh, uh, we received many hostile messages how we dare uh, <laughs> to have a... Uh, so this is something that we do. Um, so yeah, this is the this is also one of the questions. Part of the uh, we trying to, to um, have a kind of picture of how our youth are seeing the recent past. So this is a summary of, of our uh, report. But this is one of the most interesting questions. So only 30% um, of possible Serbs actually knows. Uh, up to 30% actually knows uh, about the uh, uh, war crimes that happened to their own community. And only 1% of Kosovo Albanians are aware that there were actually atrocity happened also to the Serb community in Kosovo. When we talk about the Albanian community and the war crimes that happened to Albanians, uh, 40%, up to 40% Kosovo, uh, Kosovo youth knew to mention more to three than five places. We use this three to five uh, as a category of, of uh, good knowledge. We also have average and low knowledge. And only uh, four, uh, four up five percent of Kosovo Serbs know to mention uh, places where war crimes happened uh, toward Albanians, which is still an advantage compared how much uh, Albanian youth know about the atrocity that happened to the Serb community. So um, these are. All these uh, information 
really help us when we advocate for human rights and we, when we do strict action. I only want to mention that every uh, public uh, strict action that we do, even though that we uh, work there as a staff, we really encourage that our activists use our spaces and feel ownership to their ideas. Um, youth participation for us is really very, very important. So this is also one of our recommendations to, to, have, to have a youth that will directly have somehow power of shaping intercultural communication. Having a state which will provide, uh, I would say, a factographic education, I'll not even go a diverse education, ambitious education, only to, to learn the basic facts, such as that uh, not dividing with civilians or having great meta-narratives of the 90s of uh, evil versus good, them and us. So uh, we will have, I don't know, a more inclusive society, a more, a more, more honest society. It will, it will be a, a beneficial for the whole citizens of Kosovo. So, thank you. Do you have any other questions? Thank you, Venera. Um, a very interesting presentation, and actually, it's interesting to see that some of the results sort of keep coming up, such as the, the, the lack of contact in our research is 60%, never have contact between one another, here it's, seven, uh, it's uh, 60, 70. Um, so, I mean, it's just an interesting uh, point of view. I'll pass the floor now to Eredin, um, and he's going to talk a bit more about what media can do. Hello everyone, thanks for having me here. Uh, while talking of the media, I believe I do not represent like the whole <laughs> picture of uh, the media office here in Kosovo, but still, uh, I think now I'm, I'm going to more focus on the consequences of what all the others have in introduced uh, today. Um, and that's because the media has uh, a significant uh, role in all these prejudices, in all these divisions, and in all the uh, other um, results that we have uh, from the, uh, take it from um, ethnic uh, divisions, religious, or uh, others. Uh, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you are misinformed, said Mark Twain. Um, I believe this explains a lot, but in the case of Kosovo, you, we, or, or in the case of Serb-Albanian relations, we have both of them. We don't read the newspapers, but even when we read, we get misinformed. And not only that, we get lots of prejudices, and we have a lot of elements why this is happening and I'm very pleasant to try to explain why. Some of them, like going to the, it, I mean, after the war, we cannot say that everything started after the war with this, it has a history of dehumanization of the others and a soft, sort of even demonization, but as well, I don't want to go that much in the history of Garashanin and everything that we have been told like as Kosovo Albanians, because we never have seen ourselves as youth, for instance, when we were at school. We were, to some extent, indoctrinated as well. We are just sort of dem demonizing the others and not thinking that there, there isn't any good Serb in, on earth, you know? So that's what we were told, most of us, because that's how our societies work. As Winston Churchill said, the Balkans produces much more history than it, it can consume. So we are too much bounded with history, and our history is completely, not when I say our, I say the Balkans, is completely biased. And what we know today, as, as we could see from Danela's uh, presentations, you see 60% of the youth, they, meet, they, they didn't meet the other side. It was the Albanians in this case, and yeah, it, including myself. At the age of 24, I met the first Serb during my studies. And how can you expect that a young, at the age of 24, can so easily like be open-minded? And where does that open-mindedness come when you have a society, when you have a lawyer, a very prominent lawyer, as Venera told about the case of Tom Gashi, who refers in very derogatory language 
such as Shkia in this case, for the Serbs. So you cannot expect that youngsters in here that are going to the universities will, will behave otherwise when they have these such models of using derogatory language in, on daily basis. And it's not only them. I'm going to tell you one case with, with when, when, since I became a, a, a journalist, it's only eight months actually. And, yeah. and one day with my colleague, we were, uh, we were in the office and she told me, hey, look at this title. I don't want to mention the media, but that's one of the most reliable medias in Kosovo that I attend. And it was, can you imagine, it was, the, the title was so contentious. It was, half of the Serbs do not take shower uh, regularly, in a regular basis. And, you know, I'm not interested, the tendency of the title can only be seen in the comments, saying, oh, we all know that they were dirty, oh, we all know that they, they were this and on and on, and that continues with countless of comments. And this is how the public opinion in, in here is shaped, in the total mass where everyone says everything that desires and everyone who pretends and and follows agendas. And when we talk of Milosevic, when he took power in 1989 and he used the media as a state apparatus uh, for his own interest with demonizing and dehumanizing the Albanians, it was only him at that time, the state apparatus. But even recently, what, what we have? We have oligarchs controlling the media, taking Serbia, taking Kosovo. We have an uncontrolled environment of the media where everyone can post what what he or sh uh, what, what what they want. Where they can publish anything, and what are the consequences of that? Who asks you whether whether you use uh, Shkia, Serb, or how you refer to the Serbs? No one. No one is interested. Actually, if you report for that, you would have problems, as as they have complained for the Tom Gashi's claim. Um, and not to speak about the language barriers. I mean, as, as Kosovo 2.0, we have also the Serbian uh, language included. Whatever we publish, we do it in English, Albanian, and Serbian. And that we have done it only because we, we want the youngsters in here to see something, to read something more about Kosovo, because we don't know the Serbs and the Serbs do not know us, the youth, I'm, I'm talking in this case. It's an immense lack of communication, and the lack of communication creates hatreds. Um, I'm going to show you something also interesting with uh, the only communication that I see is about, amongst youngsters, is going, if you go to these sports, uh, Facebook pages such as Ultra Stifo, where you see people, for instance, reporting that in Poland, I don't know, Warsaw played against Krakow, and then you have there Kosovo and Serbia, and then the others going and insulting each other. This is the communication we have today, so we should not be astonished. But as societies, I think we have a duty to change the course. And how we change the course? We change the course if we try if we reflect that politics is not doing its job and it's the society that throughout even these initiatives brings all the youngsters and discuss and make them discuss with each other. We have seen that politics in this uh, in this all these years after the war, despite the fact that we have had dialogue and whatever, didn't change anything in the ground in terms of relations between Serbs and Albanians. We are still living se separated and the segregation continues endlessly. We don't know when it's going to end. Uh, so the problem, coming back to the media, is that the media is not being an, an active, uh, is not having an uh, emancipation role, but uh, in fact is more leaded by the popular masses. And this is a very big problem. So the ones who are owning the media today, in general, if I may, make this a general problem, they, you know, when they put even titles and the news, they want to choose, you know, to pick up the news that they think can get more clicks. And that's very much problematic. 
So they don't go to find, they don't report for lots of events that are happening, cultural, take it. If politics is, cannot bind people, try it with culture. But the media is not interested to report that, for instance, last week, the Young uh, Initiative for Human Rights uh, in cooperation with, uh, uh, with some NGOs from Serbia organized uh, a, a, a documentary film, uh, show, uh, uh, screened uh, a documentary film in Prishna about the war crimes and the uh, author was the Serbian, uh, Serbian uh, producer. No, I didn't see much in the media that, but that tells about 800 people who were uh, killed and, 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 and uh, were found in Batainza uh, mass grave. It, you don't see the leading uh, media outlets in here reporting for this issue. I think it's very crucial so we do, not, we do know these uh, things and then the youngster will have another approach and will not be captured by news uh, only when we play football such as the last year, October last year when we have had like more than a month of, of, of wranglings in, on the internet between youngsters and who not. Everyone was saying, uh, insulting on ethnic basis and what, what not. So, um, so yeah, I think what we should try to do is that to build as, a, as media, we should have a role to, of emancipation. Society. I think this is the key role that the media should have. And even in terms of trying to diminish the differences and to diminish the hatreds that has captured this region. But it's not happening because, I mean, it, it's still, I'm coming back to politics, it still has captured these societies. In Serbia, you see that Fucic is being accused of uh, capturing all the the, the media and using for its own purposes. In here, you see the main television how it's <laughs> how it's terribly being controlled, and so what 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 can you expect? And the everything that remained in here seems to be the political dialogue, which is in Brussels. We see good smiles and shaking hands, but we see no result in the ground. And I every day I pass through all uh, Chaglavica. Uh, I may see some old Serbs living, maybe even youngster. I don't know whether they are Serbs because I cannot identify. They are same as I am. Uh, but you know, you never think that you could stop there and drink a coffee. Why don't we think in this way? Why don't we stop there, like as human beings, have a coffee over there, try to say some words, exchange? We we have immense lack of communications and. To conclude, the lack of communication only produces, generates hatreds. And with hatreds and lack of communication, we have seen the results that we're suffering for these decades. So we should change the course if we want a better life and a peaceful Western world. Actually, with your with your last saying that we should change the course, I would also like to open up the discussion uh, session now, because I think I also think that we should change the course and that this course should be in um, the hands of youth because they make them most of our population, at least in Kosovo, they have the capacity, the potential, and the will to engage in overcoming the divide. But the problem is how to find this, uh, how to do this practically, basically. So um, can I open up the floor for, I don't know, questions, comments, suggestions? What are your thoughts on this, especially people who are present in, uh, in the podium? Thank you. 
the one thing that we have done for the 13 years that we exist is the regional exchange programs. Well, but it's still uh, um, a civil society activity. So you can ha have, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 uh, regional exchange students per year through the Olga Western Balkan, but that's not enough. That's why uh, this uh, last two years we are advocating to open a regional office uh, in Balkans, which will be uh, all the former Yugoslavia state except Slovenia plus Albania. Um, after the match between Albania and Serbia, we saw the need also to include Albania. Many processes now have been done. This was initiated actually from uh, Angela Merkel to establish a regional exchange program, something uh, as uh, similar with the Franco German office that the, the, the uh, regional exchange programs in there after the World War II. So uh, we are monitoring and consulting that process, something that we did uh, done as a civil society, we want to do it also institutional. From each country there are two representatives, one is government, one is from civil society. Our biggest worry is because of this uh, uh, civil society, government, uh, cooperation is how we look the, uh, the content of the regional exchange program. Since one of the pillars is social justice. So we actually want, when we do this regional exchange program, that all these students from various countries visit the uh, memorials with different perspectives and narratives. So they can uh, grow inside empath empathy, human empathy, and somehow to this nationalism. So that is, that is one idea that is going on, and we really hope that uh, it will be in the end established. So we will see uh, further more. Um, if I may just add to what Linda was commenting as well and to what you are showing with your work, um, there is one obstacle in terms of how these youth or how these organizations work and what is their impact. And that is because that there is this principle of principle self-selection. So to start with, people who are more open-minded have a tendency to actually join these organizations and therefore we're not speaking about the other part or you know, people who don't fall in that category and it's hard to, to open them up, it's hard to reach them, it's hard to include them. And then the second part is that whenever we speak about, let's say, these exchange programs, um, at least from our data we've had this coming up as an idea and I don't know if you do that or not, but one of the suggestions given was to do exchange programs within Kosovo. So, because most of the, the, these organizations, they work, let's say, with exchange programs between Kosovo and Serbia. So they managed to somehow bridge the gap between Serbs in Serbia and, and uh, Kosovo in Kosovo, but not necessarily improving uh, the relationship with Serbs here. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the feedback that we've gotten on the field when we did our qualitative uh, portion of the study, they were saying that we should find ways to actually do these sort of programs within our house so that we actually help in that, um, in that direction. Do you do something like that? Uh, well, I absolutely agree that it's much easier uh, for many reasons to have regional exchange programs uh, cross-boarding than inside of the country. Uh, we had, in previous years, we have visiting inside of the Kosovo, and we are still trying to get support for that program, and we hope in the future we will, ha we will have. But in this uh, right code that is called Regional Youth Cooperation Office, it will be established, it is also foreseen to have inside visiting. Okay. So uh, that's something that we advocate to have it, but it's all in the end uh, who will support you. Um, we had another question there, and then we go back to you. Okay. We don't have a uh, mic. So. I, I actually was thinking about saying a lot of things. I didn't know where to start. There's so much I, I like in your presentation, so much I don't agree with. Let me think of where to start. I'll make it simple, make it a question, not a comment. Uh, how much do you think it actually, it is actually a comment? How much do you think it is actually up to the top levels, to governments, for the people down on the ground to integrate with one another or start meeting one another and hang out with one another? How, much, how important do you think it is for Serbia to show some signs of acknowledgement for the, what has happened here 
in order for people to feel better about, you know, meeting one another. In other words, does Serbia need to accept the fact that, you know, there's been atrocities done here so that we could overcome this <coughs> obstacle and then allow people to, okay, as I said, start being people and not peoples. Mm -hmm. I have other yeah. questions, maybe after other people ask, but what do you think about this question? Yeah. Well, I don't want to shift to politics, though I, I studied five years for politics and I really like these uh, topics. I cover actually in Kosovo 2.0 uh, political uh, issues, but I wanted to talk more for the media and how, like, the journalists and how us like to try find different, um, like, cultural ways of how the youth can cooperate and not to remain uh, a hostage of politics. But if we come to politics, then of course I have my opinions. Actually, the conclusion that because politics is failing to reconciliate the, the relation was consequence of what I said, that maybe we should look other alternatives. What politics should do, that of course that would be like maybe, uh, as you said, an apology or that would be a, in, in my opinion, and I'm not representing Kosovo 2.0 in this case, this is my, my opinion, I think that that would be a very good preconditions because if we're talking of Europe, and if we're talking of European history, then we see how France and Germany dealt after the Second World War, if we're going that far. Uh, so, apologies, war reparations, and that's, that's a great precondition that you have to move forward. So I always say that with this dialogue now, they, they are telling that they will discuss highways and railways and whatnot. That's good, we need highways, but first of all, we have to dig inside and see whether there are some bones of more than 1,600 people that are still missing in Kosovo. And also Kosovars, Kosovo Albanians should know that amongst this number there are as well Kosovo Serbs who are still missing. So we should have a sense of justice and we should, when we think of the war crimes and everything, we should not think of only one side, you know. So because I have, I have sort of uh, impression that when we talk of the war crimes and so on and so uh, we, we don't, I really didn't know uh, till the age of 24 that I, that there are Serbian missing people in Kosovo. I simply didn't know. I don't know why. Maybe in the media, maybe the environment where I was raised. I didn't know that. I, of course I knew that there were during the war killed as well. Serbs have been killed, but I didn't know that there were missing people and it's hundreds of them. I hope I, I gave you the response that you gave. We also have, oh yeah, okay. And then we have to join to, to that uh, discussion. Well, I absolutely agree that Serbia government is one of the major obstacles of not uh, achieving, I would say, trust, not reconciliation um, between the states. But this kind of logic, uh, waiting of their acknowledgement, it should not be used as an argument to slow our inside processes of in to achieve an inclusive uh, society. So if we acknowledge certain victims, we acknowledge because there are our citizens and they, because we will not uh, use ethnic divided policies because we want to clean our mess first. Uh, I really do under, uh, understand what your, which, which is your point of your, of your questions, but um, I will uh, again use the example of Croatia, having that argument for many years, we will not deal with our past because Serbia never had an apology. Uh, but what happened to Croatia now? So they have the more, most extreme uh, right-wing government, and more than ever they're having one of the greatest gatherings in 2016 of Ustasha movement since World War II, which, have, uh, which uh, has a, a movement that collaborates with the Nazis. So for me, this is a very dangerous phenomenon that are happen happening with this kind of position of, oh, we will wait until Serbia do, uh, we will wait until Serbia to, apo uh, to apologize. Serbia government doesn't even recognize Srebrenica as a gen genocide. So, I, I absolutely agree it's a major obstacle, but uh, let's focus inside of our countries, but we can do for our citizens to feel comfortable, how we can achieve our society to be more just. And maybe, I don't know, set example for them also. I also agree when we talk about the, um, um, issue of disappearing person that, sh that it, it's Serbia's fault that is not giving 
the inf uh, information of mass graves or what happened to these people and other information. So, yeah, I agree in certain point at, at your critique, but uh, I will also say that let's maybe focus on what we can do in our environment. Thank you. Can, can I just pass the mic to Adrian because he also has a comment uh, to your question. This mic? much. Uh, a comment on, on reconciliation and, uh, and the exchange programs and knowledge. Look, as, as, as more a society is open, that's the better for that particular society. Uh, Kosovars and Albanians will not uh, lose anything if they are open to uh, recognizing their own faults or uh, uh, recognizing other cultures and, and languages as well. Uh, the problem with uh, reconciliation is that uh, whether we want to bypass uh, Serbia or political developments, uh, it, it's just that so much you can do without uh, political reconciliation. Uh, it was, uh, we take example of Europe, it, it was uh, General de Gaulle and Konrad Adenauer who uh, established the exchange program that you guys were, were referring. So it was a very political decision uh, on the part of both Germany and France to leave the past behind and to focus on reconciliation. Uh, and that can pave the way for a uh, very uh, uh, productive exchange and knowledge of both culture and so forth. Uh, so without that, I'm sorry to say, but uh, uh, the one-sided initiatives uh, are always doomed to fail. Uh, or they will produce very limited results. And I agree that we should look at our own ho house and we should focus on the things that we can do as a uh, Republic of Kosovo, as citizens of Kosovo, as Albanian majority within this Republic, what we can do to uh, make better our own uh, house and our own uh, society. But it's just uh, 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 an uphill battle uh, if you are trying to reconcile with somebody that doesn't recognize you, with somebody that uh, uses very harsh political um, uh, uh, discourse. You, you just mentioned uh, uh, an independent lawyer uh, using a derogative uh, uh, reference to serve. Well, you know, we just had uh, a, a minister of foreign affairs using highly derogative uh, uh, um, uh, term for for all Albani Albanians. It's the public official. It's it's, it's a different. So it's it. It makes it really difficult for us to to work on that on, on that regard, and we have to to acknowledge that. So it's it's a uh, it, it's uh, you know this uh, cross Balkan and cross regional initiatives uh, in an environment where where states and political uh, agendas are, are are completely not in line with with with. Uh, with uh, what we want to achieve is very difficult. That uh, that thing, you know, you, you can't move away from politics. And as I said, uh, look at the example of Europe. It was a conscious political decision. Even now, uh, in Germany and in France, uh, even parties in opposition, and parties in position, they don't use the past. They don't use the grievances between the two nations to gain political gain. This is this is what it should be. What, what an ideal uh, 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 Europeanization of Western Balkans would look like, where opposition parties would not say, oh, you know, uh, we are going to come to power and be much tougher than Albanians or Serbs or Macedonians or whatever, but they will use other types of <coughs> means to come to power rather than uh, uh, national authority. So it's, uh, it's an uphill battle, but I do agree that uh, we on our part should try to do our best. Thank you, Adrian. I was just, well, kind of trying to make a connection between what he was saying, what Adrian was referring to, and what our data say, in terms of, okay, yes, I also agree that it should be two-sided, but then who should do this, at the political level or other levels as well? Because in our study, um, and this is cross-country, so 
respondents from all four countries, youth from all four countries, show that they have very low trust in institutions. And if we compare the institutions that we've measured, the governmental ones really uh, stand the lowest compared to religious institutions, to international institutions, etc. So we have this sort of discrepancy, okay, we want to to uh, them to, I mean, we want to have initiatives, we want to have these two party um, uh, initiatives working on, but then how do we do it if youth don't really trust those, those institutions? That's one. And second, we've also measured the extent to which youth consider themselves to be a changing agent. The, they consider themselves to, um, well, to engage in, in political activities. And that is also very low. So you have potential. Um, these organizations that deal with these kind of things are, don't seem to be the majority among youth because most of youth think, at least in our samples, they think that, or they're not really willing to, they don't see any point in engaging in political activity, which is again sort of counterintuitive. So how do we move forward? Comments? tragic as it is described here in the panel because for example in the southern part of Mitrovica while I walk I, I used to hear many of Serbs speaking Serbian in front of me and also in front of other people without any problem while in the northern part for example if you go on as an Albanian and speak uh, Albanian, you might have uh, problems there. But for example, when it comes to business, Albanians and Serbs seem to go very well. We have seen many examples of this, of illegal uh, crimes in the northern part of Kosovo. Both national, uh, minor, I mean both nas nations, Serbs and Albanians, seem to cooperate a lot of in, in these things. But, uh, Mm, I think that the main problem, I'm going to have to turn to politics, because I think we, t we, we seem to, t we tend to blame the people mostly. But I don't think that the problem are the people, because we, the people, no matter if Albanians or Serbs, we are a victim of politics. For example, I do have Serbian friends from Belgrade, and I speak, I used to speak with them and stay with them and talk with them. But they seem to be more liberal towards Kosovo and towards what Serbia did here. I talk to them very freely, but when I go, for example, at home and listen to Ivisa Tasic or Vujic say that Kosovo is not a country, we will never recognize it, uh, they even not recognize the victims here, it's obvious that it's hard for me and also for other people to try and, uh, you know, uh, be much more open with Serbs and be much more related. That's why I think that uh, the, the problems is, despite the fact that you mentioned here that the, we should be the, pe the people should start to uh, incorporate, with, incorporate with each other, I still think that the main problem is politics and they have to change the attitude in order for the people to to relate with each other. I also, uh, I think it's uh, also, I also would blame the international community here. Because, you know, we have to, it's easy for us or for someone else who hasn't had anyone lost, for example, in the war, the Serbs talk. But uh, for Albanians, these are recent uh, issues and it's still hard to talk for them because they lost their children or their relatives. That's why I have to say again that the, the biggest problem here is the politics. The Serbs that lived in Mitrovica, 
that are more older cells that lived even uh, before the war, they seem to not have so much problems with albinos. I have friends from the northern part of Israel, so I would go with them, talk to them. But the problem are the newcomers from Serbia. The Serbian government has brought them in with Rovica and is manipulating with them. That's why, again, as a consequence of the manipulation of politics, people are still having problems with each other. So I would like, I would like to, to see also the international community blaming much more and uh, asking much more politics seriously to change the attitude from, by the Serbian side and also from the Albanian side in order then to see the people uh, react more openly with each other. I actually agree that it's absolutely not about blaming and it's absolutely not about pointing fingers and saying that, you know, the population, it's the population's fault or it's the Albanians or the Serbs' fault. No, it's not about that. But it's about how to find ways from a policy level, from a legal point of view, from an intervention point of view, to find ways that can actually make an impact and provide the possibility of, of, of um, if nothing else, of testing their ideas that they have about each other. And not having contact is a major obstacle in that. I mean, in, from a, my point of view, there's tons of research in social psychology, and one of the crucial points when it comes to contact that it shows is that it just divides people more and more because it gives more space for uh, uh, um, even worse uh, cases of prejudice and discrimination and stereotyping and whatnot. So the fact that we have a segregated context is particularly um, problematic when it comes to finding ways to actually overcome this. Yes? Okay, first of all, uh, I would like um, to say a word for all the panelists. Uh, everything that there was uh, said today here was really, really good. I mean, I love the, stat the statistics also. And what I find truly interesting about statistics is that um, I get to know something that I previously thought uh, was true. First, the, the fact that uh, Kosovo uh, Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo have uh, had a chance uh, had no chance to meet each other. Um, the chance is really slow. Uh, low. Um, for example, Albanians, 60% um, of them had no chance to meet a Serb, and almost the same applies for Serbs. Um, the thing is, recently I started working as an intern in the Akuni Hill Center. This center, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's a multi-ethnic center. The, the cause of this center is to actually um, to make all communities together through activities, to make games together, to make courses. We, we have all sorts of activities in there. And I met a lot of uh, Serbs there, and they were truly uh, enthusiastic uh, to meet uh, new people, Albanians especially, from South. But until now, they had no chance. But now that when they did, they were truly enthusiastic and even surprised. Why surprise? Because maybe that they thought that we are, I don't know, different species of humans or whatever. But that's what the uh, media does. Even what Eraldin uh, says, uh, he said, I mean, he talked a lot about the power of media, what media can do to public opinion, how public opinion is shaped, because not everyone has the ability to think uh, throughout the article and to analyze it. Everyone just reads maybe just the title and starts creating a public opinion over that. And that's truly dangerous. I mean, there should be a mechanism that actually uh, does not allow media to write just anything without facts. There is, actually. But it's not functional. Okay, yes. I just want to make a short comment. A short comment. Hopefully, I want to win the prize. Um, anyways, I'm just really surprised by your comment that you were surprised that uh, there are missing people from Serbian side as well. I mean, of course, there are going to be uh, miss some missing people from the Serbian side as well because it was, it's been a war, uh, and the KLA was real, and the NATO bombings afterwards. 
but still we have to check the numbers and the percentage. Uh, and in this case, I, I truly give, give credit to Venera's organization for doing a really great job for um, honoring all the victims regardless of their ethnicity. Well, when I said that I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know in terms of numbers. I didn't know that uh, hundreds of them were missing. Of course, I may have assumed that there should be some few missing. But because of the lack of information, I didn't know the real numbers. So maybe I'm, I could no, have been... I'm not just talking about the general perceptions, because not every Sumi that with which is actually a Serbian. We have a lot of them. Uh, from the Bosnian side as well. But I actually, I'm actually talking about the general perception. So. Thank you. Um, if there are, I know that we've really passed our time. And we have uh, also I some kind of answers on the comments. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, of course. Since I also feel obligated to answer some comments. So first I will start with Adrian. Uh, about reconciliation processes. If we do a regional exchange, we are changing also the mindset how we see social values. So if we have a, a youth that will see all these places of atrocity, this youth will be in one position to elect future politi politicians. So this is also an angle how we can uh, shift maybe uh, the power. Uh, also, um, uh, when he, you mentioned when the minister had offensive um, terminology of discriminating Albanians, but let's not forget that we are now a republic, we are now a state, and we are now a population. Albanians are now a major population. So when the minister did that offensive term, there were mass protests, and he resigned uh, from his uh, position. Where an Albanian made the offensive uh, term to the Serbs, he, as a part of the major population, he's now in power, and nobody is now protesting while Tongashi says Shkia. In the other thing, uh, you mentioned that in Mitrovica, in Mitrovica, you have daily, uh, you, you have possibility of daily uh, interaction more. Well, yeah, that's true. But then again, we need to have a wider perspective to the whole. This is a research that was conducted in the whole territory of uh, uh, of Kosovo. Uh, other thing, I'm glad that you, uh, that Arthur also talked. Uh, one thing that we, we talk about victims is not only to acknowledge the old victims, but it's also to shift how we see uh, the war in the 90s. We, in our um, legislation, we don't have any reparation to the victims who uh, uh, were killed by NATO bombing, because the law says you can only be repaired by the Forza Termico, um, enemy, enemy, yeah. NATO was not Forza Termico, so those people who, who died, they can, their family cannot get any reparation because the law cannot perceive them in that category. That's also one of the things that we uh, advocate. So, uh, I don't know, many things were said, and I'm, I'm actually very glad that um, I'm here. Uh, I will also um, emphasize the one thing that you say, that economics can maybe in the future get us more closer. The interest of uh, uh, gaining capital, it seems to be very trendy as a political system uh, in Europe and in America, so maybe this is the uh, one of the good aspects uh, of that. Serbia, uh -huh, okay. who referred to Kosovo as ISIS uh, and, and, and uh, um, in a very public and international forum. Uh, and Nikolic as well. And you can never ever uh, uh, compare the level of language that uh, Serbian politicians use for Kosovo Albanians uh, with that of uh, politicians and public officials of Kosovo. Uh, of, of Kosovo. Again, uh, an independent uh, a, a use of derogatory uh, language is bad in any case, but uh, public officials, uh, uh, like those that, that hold public office, not lawyers, lawyers are, should be held accountable as well, as every citizen, but public officials should be held uh, more responsible because they represent the office that they were elected. Uh, uh, and, and that's why it is, it is uh, so just to make a distinction and clarity of what, what, what I refer to. So. Thank you, I absolutely agree with you, but then again, uh, I just want to emphasize that it's very important that we focus what we can do in our community. Okay, um, yeah. yes, last comment, sorry, last comment, and 
then I'd like to uh, pass the floor to Advir Chose, who's our fellow uh, colleague from Macedonia. He's one of the leaders of Alsa Television, it's bilingual media, to sort of wrap this portion of how we are portrayed and how we can work together. Uh, yes, sorry. Sorry. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I have one just quick comment for this last bit that was discussed and then a question for you. Uh, Serbs started the war with Slovenia, with Croatia, Bosnia, and Kosovo, right? And this shows a trend. I don't think you can use language like that to make things equal. You know, yes, there were Serbs, of course there were Serbs who died. We can all assume that. We can all assume there were probably a lot of Germans killed by Jews Right? But we don't talk about that because, as the gentleman here said, numbers are important, or at least the size, the scale of things is important. The oppressor and the oppressed is important. We have to keep these things in mind, right? This was my comment. My question to you, Donald, during your study, well, when you were asking questions to the Albanian respondents and Serb respondents, did you notice any... Uh, Okay, let me reformulate this. Do you think there's still that need for the Albanians to see themselves as united with Albania? Is it a catharsis for Albanians if this would have happened? Is, is, is there a desire for this still, yeah. whether hidden, whether it shows up or not? What do you think? And what's the size of, of that Well, desire? to be honest, this is not something that we've measured, so I cannot scientifically say that it is or it is not. But what I can add is that when we've had our qualitative um, part portion of the studies, when people talked about their identity, when people talked about their Albanian identity, yes, of course, Albanian identity was pretty much in a larger format, seen in a larger um, sort of cultural and, and ethnically formed in that sense. But a lot of the youth were referring to the Kosovo identity as well. They were saying, or they were considering it as a political identity, as something that is imposed, etc., etc. But at least they were acknowledging it and they were positive about it. So I guess if I were to sort of detach that portion of the study, I would say that that's not the case. But this is just, you know, two focus groups and two case studies, and it's not something that I could generalize to um, a large extent. Okay, I'll um, pass on the floor to Admir to hopefully give us some positive notes. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Your speeches were actually remarkable. I guess even the presentation from the very beginning, which is a good mission to have this conference, especially in this time. Uh, my name is Amir Chosa. I am the editor in chief in Al at Alsa and TV station. Um, actually, I'm originally from Albania. I'm not from Macedonia, even though it's already 10 years now living in Macedonia in Skopje. And I do speak now even Macedonian, which is was actually a must, you know, when, when you definitely have to be part. Of, of the communication. So we already emphasized the idea that communication is a key, a master key in our societies, especially uh, those who are multi ethnic ones. So um, I would like to, to bring to you somehow uh, my experience uh, during the years. Uh, I've been working as a journalist for around 17 or 18 uh, years now. I began my career in, in Albania when I was just a student in 97 and 98 when, the, when Albania was actually in the top of the